Welcome to Fody Digital, a weekend of online conversations about dangerous realities that surround us. My name is Simon Longstaff. I'm Executive Director of the Ethics Centre and co-founder of the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. Like many other festivals, Fody was cancelled at the last minute by a government that was concerned to protect the health and safety of the community. And so now we're picking up on some of the conversations that might have taken place, but also with the added lens of COVID-19 and a pressure which is bringing a number of topics to the boil. COVID-19 has exposed in particular the vulnerability of the elderly. But as we have new understanding about the ageing process and the role that genetics and other forms of technological developments might bring in better understanding this phenomenon, we're now reconsidering what the future might be for all of us in terms of ageing. So now we can join Professor David Sinclair, live from Boston, in conversation with health communicator and doctor, Dr Norman Swan. Thanks very much, Simon, and welcome to you all to this uh, online festival of dangerous ideas. And uh, the idea that we're, the dangerous idea that we're going to be exploring um, in this next, next half hour, and hopefully with your participation, is the idea that aging is not necessarily a natural phenomenon, but actually is a disease itself. And the person whose lifetime research in this area leads him to this conclusion is, as um, Simon indicated, Professor David Sinclair, who's Professor of Genetics at Harvard Medical School and co-director uh, of the Centre for Aging Research at Harvard. Welcome to the Festival of Dangerous Ideas, David. Hi, Norman. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And given that Simon's invited us to anchor this on COVID-19, I mean, age is the dominant risk factor for serious illness and death with um, COVID-19. Well, yeah, absolutely it is. Uh, and even if you subtract all of the age-related diseases, such as diabetes and obesity, which of course play a role, age is still the biggest risk factor. There was a study that came out uh, just last night uh, from the UK that said uh, the top risk factors are actually in order, the top five, the least is diabetes, then obesity, then being male, then cancers of the blood. And by far, five times more than anything else, it's your age, how many birthday candles you've had. And my point is that aging is a disease, it's, and it's treatable. Uh, that's the main point. Um, and the same way we've worked on those other diseases one by one, now's the time to turn our attention to the main driver of illness and susceptibility to death, and that is aging itself. So why, just give me the evidence and the argument leading you to the conclusion that it's a disease. I mean, I mean I've mean, obviously been following the whole aging research for a long, long time. And people say that one of the, you know, some of the critics of this whole field say, well, we focused too much on heart disease and cancer. In other words, the diseases of aging rather than aging itself, but they don't imply that aging is a disease. They imply that we don't actually understand this underlying uh, this underlying biological phenomenon where, to put it crudely, we fall apart. Well, we, we do, and all sorts of bad things happen to us as mortal living things. Uh, but while we've you know, rallied against particular diseases, uh, we've left one thing on the table, the, the most important one, which is our physical decline over time. We call this aging, but aging is a disease. Let, let me explain why. It, so first of all, aging results in a physical decline. I think we do agree with that. That's a, that's a disease. It limits the quality of life. That's a disease. And it has a very specific pathology. You know, I can look at you and I can see that you have some of that pathology. If I look at your organs, I can see that it has pathology. Aging does all of this. And in doing so, it fulfills every category of what we call a disease, except one. And that is that it impacts impacts more than half of the population. Um, but there's no good reason why we have to say that something that happens so hold, to 49% hold of Hold on a second. It, it affects half the population? What do you mean it affects half the population? Well, so what? if you look at the manuals of geriatrics, the definition of aging uh, is that it's exactly the same as diseases, except that it affects more than half the population. Okay. So, but, what I want to make the argument here is that there's no good reason why we have to say 
that something that happens to 49.9% of the population, whether it's heart disease or diabetes, why do we call that a disease? But then something that happens to say 51% or in the case of aging, 70 to 80% of us, if we could live long enough, um, why that is something we should just cast aside and say, well, that's just life. Let's just, you know, that's natural. Uh, we don't call cancer natural anymore. We don't call heart disease natural anymore, even though they are natural. Uh, what we do is we fight against them. And the difference between those things and aging is that we, we didn't have an understanding of why aging occurs, but now we do. And so we can address it just like every other medical condition. So there are lots of downstream pathologies, if you like. I apologize to the audience for getting technical here, but look downstream pathologies. So the, comp the biggest risk factor for, it's not just COVID-19, biggest risk factor for heart disease is aging, for cancer is aging, for dementia is aging. So, so in other words, or how, to yours, your phrase, the, the number of birthday candles that you've had. So it's upstream, aging disease or not, is upstream from all these conditions. What's the pathology? the core pathology here that's driving all this stuff? Uh, well, we, we used to think it was uh, just damage to the DNA. We found out that it, it, it's not just that. There are a lot of other things that happen. And we, we came up in my field, there's a few hundred excellent researchers who work on this. We call this uh, aging research or longevity research. We came up with eight or nine hallmarks of aging. Uh, we don't call these causes of aging, because that would be too scandalous, but we, we call them hallmarks of aging. And these are things you've probably heard of, I know you've reported on them. Uh, senescent cells, zombie cells in the body, uh, loss of stem cells, telomeres, so the end of chromosomes gets shorter. There's, there's a list. But what I've been working on for my career, uh, and I believe getting increasingly close, is to identifying what makes all of those things happen. Can you boil the aging process down to an equation? that explains why we don't live longer than we actually do and why some species do live for hundreds and some for thousands of years. Which species are those? Oh, well, there are lots of species that live longer than us. We, we tend to forget that we're not uh, at, the, at the peak of evolution. Uh, so one of the best examples is a bowhead whale uh, or a Greenland shark. They live hundreds of years. Uh, and we know this, for example, because uh, people captured bowhead whales and they found a spear tip in, embedded in the skin of the whale. Uh, and those spear tips hadn't been around for at least 150 years and they dated the whale to at least 200 years old. So what, is, so, okay, let's, so take us upstream because as you say, you see these downstream effects, you see these old age cells that don't seem to do anything but get in the way of others. And people are saying, well, if we clear out this garbage from so-called garbage, we will rejuvenate. People have looked at muscle and the mitochondria, the energy compartments in muscle, and shown that in older people, if they go through high intensity exercise, you can actually turn their muscles into young muscles. And, and, you know, and then they talk about smoking and lifestyle and diet can stop your telomere shortening. Where is the, where's the magic sauce here in terms of what's yeah. fundamentally going wrong? Yeah. Well, so first of all, it's important to know that our lifespan and our health in old age, uh, only 20% of that we inherit from our parents. The rest is mainly up to how we live our lives. So that's very, that's empowering. And what we have seen is that there's an internal biological clock that ticks away and we can measure it in the lab. Norman, I could take your, your blood uh, or you could send it to me. And in a few days, I could tell you very precisely how old you are. Uh, and what you're, when you're likely to die, what year, and even could make a guess at what month. That's if you continue doing what you do. And I hope that you're healthy. You, you, I'm sure you are. You're a doctor. Uh, but if you smoke, you can have the clock accelerate. Uh, and if you eat well, if you eat less often, if you exercise, uh, you can slow that clock. So what is that clock? It's called the epigenetic clock. Uh, and it's actually the epigenome is the key word here. So let me explain briefly. There are two types of information in the body. One is genetic, the information we get from our parents. But the other type of information that is equally important is what's called the epigenetic component. And that can change with how we live our lives. 
And the epigenome, just to summarize, is how the cell reads the DNA. So a cell that's in your, in your brain has to use a particular type of epigenome to stay a nerve cell, and a skin cell uses a different epigenome. And it's the loss of that epigenomic information that I believe is the main driver of the aging process. In other words, aging is just simply a loss of information over time. Now, is that, so just let's just, because people, as soon as you start talking about epigenetics, people kind of lose the plot a little bit because it gets incredibly, so essentially you've got your genetic code and you've got the shape, if you like, of a double helix, which can get contorted and affected by the chemicals on the outside of the double helix. And different things can influence that and the different shape and conformations can affect almost like a volume switch, how well the genes work. But um, there are lots of different things that affect the, the epigenome and there are lots of different, different chemical structures on the DNA which, uh, which uh, influence that. So there's methylation and various other things. I don't want to get too technical here. But is it the whole suite of things or is there one particular element of the epigenome genome, one particular chemical species that, that affects it all, or is it a generalization? Uh, well, we know of one particular chemical mark that gets changed over time, and that's what we call the epigenetic clock. That's the DNA methylation. So methylation is just a little chemical that sticks to the, the letter C in our genome. And we can read that with a little machine about the size of a candy bar, uh, and we can that's how we read the clock. Uh, those little methyl groups change in our bodies over time, and we just read them. But that's not the only thing that changes with time. The epigenome, as you said, involves proteins that loop DNA or bundle it up very tightly like a spool or, or a hose on a driveway so that those genes stay off. And we're just learning how to fully understand how that structure is behaving over time during aging. But those DNA methyl marks are a very good clock. Now, one of the biggest discoveries that's happened over the last 12 months, uh, and I was very fortunate that my PhD student uh, was one of the people who helped discover this, is that those DNA methylation marks, when we wind back aging, and we, as I mentioned, we have a way of doing that now, those DNA methyl methylation marks, you have to remove them for the age of the cell to go back and for the cell to behave its, as though it's young again. So in other words, the clock isn't just measuring time on the wall. It's actually part of time itself. I mean, it sounds like we're getting into a craniationist argument here because you keep on going upstream. What is it that speeds up? So what creates this problem in the first place of um, the epigenome being distorted? Excellent point. And so for the last... 15 years, we, we think we've figured out one of the main drivers of the clock advancing, uh, and it's broken DNA. So every time you go out and you get sun, a bad suntan, or you get an x-ray, you're breaking chromosomes. And the act of having to stick those chromosomal ends back together, the DNA molecule, the double helix, uh, it has to open up the chromatin, as we call it, the, the epigenome has to rearrange. And then it, the cell has to repack all of those structures back together and it doesn't do it perfectly. So every time you get a broken DNA molecule in your cell, and that happens in our body about 20 trillion times every day, totally, that advances the clock by a little bit. And over time, over decades, these DNA breaks will accelerate aging. And we have good evidence for this. And one of the bits of evidence is that if we break the chromosome in a mouse, and we do that for a few weeks, that mouse will go on to age 50% faster than the brothers and sisters that didn't have that treatment. So, okay, well, let's get to the question. We'll, we'll double back to some of these issues, but everybody's now wanting to know what reverses that. Um, so there's been a lot, because there's been a lot of research which suggests the same things that shorten telomeres as a marker of aging also affects the, the genome. It's whether or not you're eating lots of vegetables, how much red meat you're eating, whether you're getting exercise, those things all influence the epigenome, whether you're smoking and so on. And is that all we're talking about here? Um, that it slows, so in other words, those things, are they just slowing down the epigenomic distortion or 
are we getting a reversal? Because, I mean, what, what, what everybody has to realize is that you're actually 94 and um, you just look as if you're 36. <laughs> uh, well, under lockdown, I'm starting to feel like 94 with three teenage kids in this house. Uh, but, but this is the incredible thing is that over the last 25 years, my colleagues and I have found that there are certain genes that control the health and age of cells. And we can slow that down, as you said. Some of the genes we work on, they have a name called sirtuins. There are seven of these genes in our bodies. And these proteins, the sir part of their name stands for silent information regulators. And these are the proteins that help bundle up the DNA in those spools, as I mentioned. So they're epigenetic regulators. Now, they're just part of the story, but they're very important ones. So if we give the cell more of these epigenetic uh, regulators, we can do that genetically or turn them on with molecules like resveratrol or NAD boosters, which we can perhaps talk about later. What's important is that they stabilize the epigenome. And animals that have a more stable epigenome, they actually live longer. But here's, here's the really important thing. We've just discovered in the last year or so that we, we can tell the cell how to reset the epigenome and reset the clock. So not just slow down the progression of aging, but truly reset the age. And there are three genes that we've discovered that if we put them into the cell and turn it on, and in the case of the, the mouse study that we hope to publish shortly, uh, we can reprogram the eye and get the back of the eye to be young again, the retina, and those old mice get their vision back like they were young again. And we can see that those cells aren't just behaving like they were young, but when we read their clock, their epigenetic clock, they are literally young again. And so this is the first evidence that you can reprogram in a safe way, a, a very complex tissue of an animal and perhaps a human one day. And what's the manipulation? Is it a drug? Is it environmental change? What is it? Well, we're working, uh, my colleagues and I are pretty excited about finding molecules we could eventually rub on the skin or put, you know, put in our mouth. But right now it's a gene therapy and we deliver it into the eye of the mouse. And in a couple of years, we think our glaucoma patients uh, it's a viral genetic uh, delivery of gene therapy. And these three genes are really interesting. These three genes control uh, embryonic development when we're very young. But when we're old, uh, even when we're teenagers, they switch off so that we are at the mercy of aging. But we found that if we turn those three uh, embryonic genes back on just slightly and for three weeks, that is enough to tell the cell somehow to flick the reset switch and get back the original youthful function and age of the cell. And these three genes actually um, are called Yamanaka genes because a Japanese professor by the name of Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for discovering that these sets of genes could actually turn an adult cell into a stem cell that you could then make new tissues and organs out of. Now that's a, an incredible discovery, certainly Nobel Prize worthy. But what they didn't consider at the time was that you could use the same kind of technology to partially wind back the age of organs and tissues as well. And so just to explore that a little bit, some people have said if you do that, paradoxically, you could actually increase the risk of cancer because you're affecting, you can affect the immune system, you can affect how cells divide. It's not necessarily an unalloyed good when you do that. Right. And, and it's a fair point. And actually, uh, some of my colleagues who've published brilliant papers on turning on all four of the Yamanaka factors have actually found that those mice do develop tumors if you turn it on for a long time. But we discovered that if you take out the one that causes cancer, the other three are very safe. And we've had them turned on at high levels in the eye of mice for over a year and in the whole body of, of mice for uh, at least nine months now, I think longer with, if anything, fewer tumors. So we think that we're turning on a program that animals like uh, salamanders or axolotls use to regrow their limbs. Um, perhaps you could say a, a reptile could regrow their tail. Uh, and we think that we're finally learning how to use those systems in mammals once again. Now, not everything that happens in a mouse or a reptile happens in humans. How confident are you and what signals are you getting that 
the discoveries you're making are actually applicable to humans because there's been a lot of disappointments down the years that particularly in cancer research that get very excited over things that happen in mice they kill 3,000 mice but it doesn't happen in, uh, in adults yeah humans well it's a fair point and I've I've spent my career uh working in biotech so I know that how long things take and how risky they are uh well first firstly I would say that I think we've turned a corner in at least scientific understanding of how to reset the body, uh, at least of a, of a mouse. But also consider that, that we found a very fun fundamental process. We first discovered the reset system uh, with the sirtuins and aging in yeast cells. These are you know, baker's yeast, You've, you drink them in beer. Uh, we see the same system occurring in, in other rodents, uh, in mice. Uh, we see it in uh, in whales, for example. It looks like it's conserved, and but of course, humans are very different than mice. But the fundamental basis of what I'm talking about is true, seemingly for all life, whether a, you're a yeast cell, a whale, or a human. Uh, and so we'll see. There'll probably be setbacks, of course, like all biotech. We have to be very careful to be very safe. Uh, but whether I'm going to be successful or someone else who comes along behind me will be successful, um, I'm not sure. But I think we've turned a corner now. It's as though we've we've built the glider down at Kitty Hawk. Uh, we know that we can actually glide down the, down the sand dunes. And now it's a question of not, not uh, an if, but when we will have powered flight. Um, I just want to go back to a question I asked earlier, because I noticed that one of our viewers has asked it as well. Uh, I didn't pursue it because I, I wanted to move on to other things, but I think it's worth clarifying. Right at the beginning, you said you know fifty percent of it, 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 aging affects fifty percent of people, and I was confused by that, and obviously the viewer was too. Just go back to that point, because I, I would assume that aging affects one hundred percent of people. Oh, it, it, well, if you live long enough, of course, it's going to affect everybody. There's nobody who's immortal. Uh, I think perhaps I cut out or I, I misspoke. Uh, I meant that the definition once you pass that fifty percent threshold switches into uh, aging. Okay, if something that happens to most people, then it's no longer considered a disease. For something that happens right, to so us that's horrible, it has to be less than fifty percent to be a disease. Right. So in other words, so in other words, one in three of us will die of cancer, whatever the number is. That's a disease. But if uh, three out of three of us get it, it's not disease. It's, it's assumed to be natural. But what you're saying is it could be a disease, just like the plague or something like that. Okay, let me just go to a substance you've been looking at called NAD. Just tell me a little bit about that and what sort of results you're getting with that. Uh, so NAD is the fuel for the sirtuin enzymes that control the epigenome and seem to control many aspects of health and survival. Uh, so the sirtuins in our body, there are seven of them, as I mentioned, and they control the telomeres, they control stem cells, they control mitochondria, they prevent senescence of cells, the zombie cells. So the, the, think of them as our protectors. Uh, they, they respond to adversity. So when we're running on a treadmill or when we're skipping a meal, they'll be activated because the body says, now's the time to hunker down and survive. And that's what we believe gives us our longevity when we diet and exercise the right way. Now, one of the ways that works actually is the body raises NAD levels. And NAD is a very small chemical. It's used for chemical reactions. And the sirtuins are uh, tuned in to how much NAD is in the cell. The more NAD you have, let's say you're young or you're an athlete, uh, that's good. The sirtuins will be active and they will protect you. If you're obese, you don't walk, you don't run, uh, you're always fed, uh, or you're old, you'll have lower NAD levels in your tissues and your sirtuins will work, work less efficiently and you will age faster and get diseases of aging uh, and perhaps be susceptible to COVID-19 as, as we hypothesize, as do others. So what we're working on are, and others around the world are molecules that we could deliver to a patient who's sick, uh, either with COVID or with a, a, a rare disease or even a common disease like diabetes, raise the NAD levels back up to youthful levels and improve health. Now in mice, again, the, I'm not saying this is in humans yet, but we are doing clinical trials right now. In mice, we can reverse the age of the vascular system and make mice that are old, uh, equivalent of about a 65-year-old human, able to run like they were young again with just a few weeks of treatment with a molecule that raises NAD levels in the body. 
Okay, what, given that it'll be a while yet before th substances like that are on the market, what are the, what do we know about the interventions and are they different from what, what we already know? So we know a Mediterranean style diet, you're not eating a lot of red meat, lots of different kind of vegetables with the natural chemicals that are in there like antioxidants and so on. Exercise, which has a degree of intensity to it so that you're, you're not just going for a casual walk with your friends, you're actually stressing the body. Intermittent fasting of various kinds where you're stressing your metabolism. Those are the things that people say are good for your your, your general metabolism. Uh, are those the things which seem to tie into a healthy epigenome? They are. That That's the amazing thing. Doctors and epidemiologists, nutritionists who discovered that kind of foods and lifestyles that lead to a health healthy lifestyle, a healthy uh, life, and also longevity, such as the island of Okinawa or the Mediterranean diet, they discovered these things independently from us who are working on genes and enzymes. But what we've discovered is that the molecules in those foods and those types of exercise turn on these longevity genes. There's sirtuins, but there's others. There's one called mTOR that responds to the amino acids and protein that we eat. There's one called AMPK, which responds to how much energy our cells have and how much sugar is in our body. And so in other words, what we've learned so far is that these types of diets and exercise, in it, well, I would say inadvertently, but, but not coincidentally, are turning on these genetic pathways. But what's important is that now that we know that, we can make medicines that are 100 times more powerful than you could ever get from a treadmill. And not only that, you cannot expect an elderly person to go running on a treadmill for 10 minutes a day. What we need is an IV or a pill that we can give them to revive them. So what do you do for you in your own life, apart from those things that um, you've discovered that's a handy tip for, in other words, that you've learned that you're trying out for yourself and not just your resveratrol from red wine. I mean, what, what are you, in terms of your behavior, your lifestyle? Yeah, well, I, I've been become a little bit of a, a role model here, uh, not really intentionally. I'm, I'm just a scientist trying to do the right thing. Uh, but the older I get, I, I find that, that the more interested I am in my own research. Uh, um, but so I'm, I've just turned 50. Um, my father's 80. We're both on a very similar program. Uh, we monitor what we do very carefully with with uh, rings like this um, and, and blood tests that you can get commercially, at least over here in the US. And we see what, what works for us and what doesn't. So we're not just blindly experimenting, but we are trying to see if see what happens um, in a very safe, controlled way. My father's also a scientist in Sydney. He can judge for himself. Um, so yeah, resveratrol I've been taking for 13 years. What, what's that? Go on. Sorry. Yeah, what's that? Oh, so this is called this an is called aura the ring, O-U-R-A. Kind of. Uh, it'll tell me heart rate, uh, movement, sleep patterns. Uh, it's very useful for optimizing sleep. That's one of the great things about it. Of course, we've also got these devices now as well. So my point is that if you just pop a pill or do some exercise and you don't measure yourself, you're flying blind. Um, so um, sometimes I just uh, cut to the chase and I say I wrote down what we do in my family on page 304 of the book that I just put out. But I'm not trying to sell books here. I'm just trying to say if, if we don't have enough time to get through it, people can go see what, what we do in a list. But it's a resveratrol. Uh, I do NMN. I take a bit of NMN, which is an NAD precursor that raises NAD. Um, I'm taking more olive oil since it was just discovered that oleic acid activates one of the main sirtuin pathways, just like resveratrol. So that's good for us. Vitamin D is important. Um, and also I'm taking metformin, which is a drug that is probably the, the, the craziest and danger, most dangerous idea that uh, I'll bring up, which is that there are drugs on the market like metformin for diabetes, type 2 diabetes, that have been shown in tens of thousands of people to slow down the rate of age-related diseases. So not just diabetes, but cancer, heart disease, Alzheimer's, and frailty. Um, but you need a doctor's prescription to get that in Australia and the US. We've only got one minute left, and because it's the Ethics Centre running this, some kind of, they're not forcing me to ask it, but I should ask it anyway. 
somebody would say that there's like, there's an ethical moral issue here for people living longer in a world that's hard, hard finding it hard to sustain its existing population should this be why what makes this a priority for research is it just a first world problem well the the last few months have have totally emphasized that what i'm saying is the right way to approach medicine we've been working far too long just on one disease at a time, which I call whack-a-mole medicine. And basically a doctor will prescribe a medicine, push you out the door, hope that you don't come back to something else. If you do, get another medicine and repeat until failure. But it's not just important to know why we fall off the edge of a cliff. It's to understand why we get to the edge of that cliff in the first place. The amount of money we would save uh, by reducing, even just by 10%, these chronic diseases would be the tr in trillions of dollars globally every year. Um, and as COVID-19 shows, if we had people who had a younger biological age, we may not even have a pandemic. Um, so, you know, talk about cost saving there. This is the best way that I know of to save money besides eliminating all wars on the planet. David Sinclair, thanks for joining us on the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. It's been great. Thanks, Norman. Thanks for joining us. The next session will be Stolen Inheritance at 2 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. The Festival of Dangerous Ideas and Fody Digital is presented by the Ethics Centre. Our purpose is to bring ethics to the centre of everyday life through public experiences, education, thought leadership, advocacy, consulting, and leadership programs. As a non profit organisation, Every single dollar is invested in pursuit of this purpose. Thanks to our donors and partners who help to make our programs happen. And you can donate via the website. Thank you.